Welcome back to the NJCPA Tech Talk podcast brought to you by the Emerging Technologies Interest Group. I'm your host, Sean Stein-Smith, and back for episode 12. So it's been a full year of, of this podcast. So I'm really amped to be here rounding out the current year, and I'm really happy to be doing so with our guest, who, who I will get to in just one quick minute. But but before that, just a quick bit of background about me, just in case it's your first time uh, hopping on, on the podcast with us. That's me, Sean Stein-Smith. I do a ton of work. Anything IT, corporate accounting, corporate finance linked, blockchain, crypto, AI, I'm all over it. Uh, uh, research, writing, corporate trainings, podcasts, all the rest. But but uh, but our guest for our 12th episode, so the cap it off, the first year of the NJCPA Tuck Talk podcast, I am thrilled to have back on the show, Mark Eckerley, who is a audit crypto, uh, uh, really rock star kind of guy, senior manager at Witham. He's He is the current chair of the ETIG. I'm the former chair, he's the current chair, and I'm really happy to have him here on our 12th episode today. Mark, happy to have you back on. Sean, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I got to give you props for for keeping this thing alive, just <laughs> constantly pushing out quality content each month. Uh, it's been a pleasure to listen to. Um, this is my second episode, so for the other 10 that I haven't been on, I, I, I always come back, um, give them a couple listens. It's, it's fantastic. Um, and for any of our, uh, any of our viewers or, or listeners that are watching the video content, I'm, I'm slowly adding bullet points to keep up with you, Sean. You got an extensive list of what you're doing <laughs> in the ecosystem, and I'm, 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 I'm trying to cre- keep up with you. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely, man. <laughs> I mean, there is a ton underway out there, right? Blockchain, crypto. And so, and so with that said, let's hop to it. So in, so in, in terms of the audit work, internal conversations, external conversations, what are your top sort of uh, current years of the takeaways, right? Because obviously, you know, there's a ton going on out there in the blockchain space, crypto space. We got DeFi, NFTs, you know, hearings, tax, uh, tax law changes. But but in in terms of of actual conversations, right, being had by you and your firm and your team, are there any core items takeaways? Yeah, I mean, this year has really been um, almost nonstop. Right, I think kind of taking a step back and looking at what 2021 offered us in the crypto landscape, um, it really stems from Q4 2020 and that mm-hmm. momentum wave that we really had, driven by the the dramatic increase in prices of not just Bitcoin but the Bitcoin industry or the crypto industry as a whole. Um, I think that kind of led us into 2021 with some great headway, um, which. Uh, ironically less into that that January, February meme stock movement with Doge and um, kind of opened everyone's eyes to what crypto had to offer, right? It, it, it rose so dramatically in price and people thought it was unsustainable. But if you, if you look now where we are in December, 2021, um, for the most part, it has been fairly consistent. Yes, you're going to see the five, 10% swings, but we haven't dropped down to that Five thousand, ten thousand dollar range, like I think a lot of people su- suspected we would. Um, mm-hmm. Now there has been, like I said, some significant swings year over year or, or during the year with the news that has come about. It's been a, a fantastic year. Um, but to answer your question, the I think the question um, that we come across a lot in the accounting industry is on the tax side of things because a lot of people have made a lot of money um, mm-hmm. during this year just based on what happened last year and they're holding their profits and now they're trying to liquidate some or new tokens that have risen and come to prominence this year. Um, we've seen a couple, if you think about what uh, Doge did, what Shiba Inu did, what Solana did, there's a lot of kind of one-off tokens that really sparked a lot of interest in just 2021 alone. Um, but yeah, I, I, I always say this and I beat, beat it like a drum tax is the first thing on everyone's mind when it comes to it. I work myself heavily on the audit and accounting side, um, and we're starting to see some momentum there on the um, on both of those industries as more and more companies pop up, but tax is the first thing that comes to uh, everyone's uh, focus, and we've been taking calls all year. 
Um, and it's, it's, it's just been crazy. <laughs> I mean, the interest in this landscape, it's really kind of opened everyone's eyes for the Web3 movement. I think that's the new term that's going around. Um, it used to be blockchain was the buzzword, crypto, what is it? Uh, now it's Web3, which kind of does encompass this whole NFT space. It's opened the doors for artists, creators, owning your own content, really taking title to your own assets, um, which has been the whole ethos of the, the crypto community. If you, if you go back a couple of years, right? It's kind of getting away from the centralized concept of others holding my cash. And I kind of have no control over every, anything um, to really bringing that in-house, if you will. But uh, yeah, it's been, a, it's been a crazy year. There's a lot that we can kind of go down. Um, go, each month seems to be something new, right? There's always something yeah, right. new. I mean, in your, it, it's like every week or something. It's... <laughs> no, and, uh, and to just hone in, right, on that earlier point, right? That, that whole idea of actually owning, owning your IP, owning your content, owning, owning anything, right? On a, on a blockchain-based platform, that sort of... Uh, bringing back to the individual, right? Be the individual artist, content creator, company, anybody who has access to that, uh, to that now blockchain-based ownership really is echoing back to the uh, underlying idea and the ethos of the whole blockchain idea, right? And so adding on to that, and, you know, are there any... Uh, your clients or any interest in sort of use cases of that ownership? And then how do you audit that though? How do you audit a blockchain-based uh, ownership trail, right? right? Be, because what I would argue and, and that I've heard being argued is that most uh, current audit uh, processes and audit tests aren't really made for a uh, blockchain-based ecosystem yet. Yeah, you're you're 100 percent correct. I mean, it's very. Um, I want to say, I don't want to call it a nuanced system because it's. I feel like the way we audit cryptocurrency, um, or the way we have been doing it, isn't the most efficient. Um, mm -hmm. And there's, I think, we're going to see software solutions to help make this uh, aspect just a lot better, a lot more efficient from the audit side of things. Because if you think about it, right? Blockchain technology is supposed to make everything transparent. Anyone can go and view transactions in real time, which we can, right? That's what it does. It offers that um, immutable ledger that I can go in and I can audit your records, right? You give me your public wallet, I can go on and see your, essentially your banking transactions um, with, your, with your crypto wallet. But it, it is a little bit um, manual, if you will, in order to do that. And there are some software solutions to help out there. Um, to help kind of streamline that process. But in order to essentially verify ownership to those assets, right? We, we kind of go back to old school ways and say, all right, let me, can you, can you sign a transaction, sign a hash, or can you, can you perform a micro transaction to prove that you have access to those private keys? Because it's mm -hmm. very, um, we want to be very, as an auditor, we want to be very hands-off and we don't want to ever have our clients divulge anything to do with their private keys, right? I only want to see public keys, if it's fully, fully transparent. Um, and for them to have access, for example, if they're logging in, if they have their, their, their assets on a centralized exchange, say on a Coinbase or a Gemini or some type of other qualified custodian, um, I, I don't even want to be sharing a screen with them when they're logging in just because I don't know if my computer could be compromised. I don't know who's hacking. You know, it's one of those things that I don't want to be on the hook for that. <laughs> um, so it, it, it's just very, very careful uh, to be, it's, yeah. But as far as auditing it, it's essentially going back to just performing microtransactions, signing hashes, signing transactions. And that's, I'd prefer to do a, a message signing process um, or a key signing process because I think that's a lot cleaner easier, simpler, um, and you don't ever have to broadcast, move your assets from point A to point B, which um, I think a lot of clients are moving away from because if they don't have to do it, why would you want to in, uh, essentially create more work for yourself? Mm -hmm. so, so, it kind of, so it kind of strikes me that 
on the one hand, we have this traceable, transparent, unhackable record of payments, transactional data, all kinds of stuff. And so on the one hand, that should help automate audits. But on the other hand, the actual products and services haven't quite caught up to how to basically uh, effectively bridge that gap, right? Be, exactly. Be yep. Between the audit, you know, testing and the audit rules that that all uh, firms have to follow, and then the actual uh, content or the data on the actual blockchain. Interesting stuff. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that, and that's uh, my my auditor inside me is thinking of the the audit assertions that we have mm -hmm. to keep in yep. mind. And uh, that, so that's testing the rights and obligations, the existence um, mm -hmm. of management's assertions. But when you think about the one that's the easiest when it comes to blockchain technology is, is completeness, right? I, I can go on a block explorer once I have the wallet and I can pull every transaction for the year. So I know that those records are 100% complete. I can test cutoff um, because mm -hmm. the dates are publicly broadcasted. And then the, the other one, evaluation which um, I think now we're at a great point in time where uh, for most of the more prominent digital assets, um, it's easy to come across a reasonable valuation. Whereas if you were to tell me four or five years ago that we had to come up with some valuations, there are some exchanges out there, um, or I should say pricing indexes that um, depending on their volume, depending on where they were pulling their pricing sources from might not be trustworthy, but I think we're at a good, good space now where Granted, there's thousands and thousands of digital assets, but you get to the top 100, top 200 or so, which are the ones that most of our clients are transacting with. Uh, there's good good sources out there in order to provide valuable inputs. Mm -hmm. And to just uh, echo on that, right? You know, it's always good to keep in in mind, right? That that blockchain and crypto have been so heavily talked about over the last couple of years, that our whole conversation is arguably still very, very early, right? In in actual terms of how it's going to develop, how it's going to uh, actually become onboarded at firms, in industries, at our external clients, right? And so on the one hand, I I do know, and I've heard that it can be kind of frustrating sometimes that that we haven't gotten more or improved products or external services yet but but this whole ecosystem is is still very very new and so and so it's always good to have that sort of headset yeah i mean i think we've been saying that for a couple of years now because mm -hmm. uh blockchain's always been the buzzword right that's been leading this industry yep. and i think when we take a step back we've been saying it's going to take some time to really build that infrastructure um so when you think about what is blockchain technology from a consumer facing perspective, you're not going to see it as much as you think because it, it works heavily on the back end for corporations and companies when they're trying to deliver the product to you and, and, and know where that product came from and, and track its mm -hmm. provenance and all that stuff. But it's, it, it's interesting in current times right now, because I do think, and we've been saying this for a couple of years, I, st I, I still think we are a couple of years away from kind of seeing a, a common solution rolled out for a lot of companies out there, right? Some corporations will be dabbling in it, but it might not be fully vamped up yet to what they expect it to be. Um, but when we think of what blockchain technology can offer us from a supply chain solutions uh, perspective, it's, it's neat to see that there's always some aspect of human input right? So in tr tracking it, whether you're, you're going to be able to see it on a blockchain and, and see where it came from, but it's always going to be logged at some point in time. Um, but I think right now with where we are in the supply chain management, is there's a massive holdup <laughs> with, <laughs> with just a labor shortage. And that's something that we, yeah. no matter where we are in implementing <laughs> blockchain te technology, that's one thing that I don't think we can prevent. <laughs> there's always going to be some element of human input. So uh, it, it's funny to see that we're trying to automate things and yet we're being hindered by um, some type of, of manual need of, of, of humans in that process. So it's, it's like you can't have one without the other, unfortunately. Yes. Yeah. Right. And uh, well, and I know that that as as cool or as uh, helpful as automation can be, I do believe that there's always a a uh, 
a task or a home for some human oversight over the processes, right? So, so having it be totally automated isn't always the answer either. So mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, absolutely, right? There's a lot of, you know, uh, backing and forthing, toing and uh, 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 throwing right now out there, trying to sort of get that, that one application or that one common answer, right? To how to integrate blockchain for mainstream companies. And so, and so to uh, try to sort of add onto that, Mark, you know, if, if I had to ask you your top, I don't know, two or three predictions or calls for blockchain and crypto going into uh, uh, 2022, what are those going to be? Um, so I would, I would say off the top of my head, I think we're going to see a lot more um, IPOs or public crypto companies, whether that happens through a SPAC, a special purpose acquisition, or um, direct listing or some type uh, of that. I mean, we, we, we saw the approval of Bitcoin ETFs finally. So there's more and more public that can invest there. Um, Coinbase was one of the first companies back in April. So I think we're going to see that. that kind of, there, there was a big headway there, and, and we're seeing a lot with uh, crypto mining companies. They're kind of going public with Riot Blockchain, um, and there's a few others. But I think we're going to see more and more headway there that will kind of bring some Wall Street investors into this space. Um, I also am excited about the idea of uh, Ethereum 2.0 with the transition mm -hmm. from uh, proof of work to proof of stake. I think that's going to be a big focus in 2022 as that gets adopted um, and rolled out. And then the, the big one that I'm thinking about, which 2021 has really paved the way for is this whole idea of the metaverse, right? So Facebook changing their name, it's kind of this VR mm -hmm. world, what does it look like? Um, and I don't know how this is gonna play out, but it's my, my thought right now that it's gonna bring a purpose to NFTs, right? Cause I've always kind of been a skeptic of NFTs, right? Like I can have a baseball card, mm -hmm. I'm more of a physical good kind of guy rather than having a fraction of a Babe Ruth baseball card um, and owning sure. it on a blockchain, right? And yes, it might go up and down value, but uh, if, if, it's a, if it's a possession or a good like that, I kind of always been an old school guy and want to hold the physical good there. Um, but I think having this idea of this VR world or um, I know Decentraland exists out there where there's a lot of people mm -hmm. in like digital real estate but I think that is kind of where we can kind of bridge the gap of bringing your NFTs um, to that digital world and finding use cases for them, right? Whether you're transacting with them in there, you're using them as your um, like an uh, emoji or your logo, whatever you want to call it. I think that's going to mm -hmm. be, and, and again, this isn't how it's going to be. I'm just thinking, brainstorming out loud what I think it could be because Absolutely. With Facebook changing its name, I think there's going to be a big push into this digital landscape um, it's, it, it's almost like gaming 2.0, right? <laughs> like it's mm -hmm. people just escaping to uh, another world and, and just having fun with their friends. Yeah, no, and, and you know, there are all, there are all uh, these, these sort of new applications, be it microtransactions, NFTs, virtual or augmented reality, all of which have their own applications, but yeah, probably going forward into, into 22 and and uh beyond now probably the the overall trend right right that i'm hearing quite a uh uh bit about <clears throat> is that really in 22 and beyond now all all of these individual applications are going to start to combine right to actually try to uh, develop and to market that against the mass market uh, application for NFTs or payments or other aspects of it. So. Yeah, I thought the, the one thing that was neat to see over probably the last 12 to 18 months was, um, I wanna call them competing blockchains where you see mm -hmm. the Solana or Polkadot blockchain, try and compete with the Ethereum blockchain because um, uh, it seems like every application is built on the Ethereum blockchain nowadays and gas fees are just outrageous. Mm -hmm. um, so to see uh, competitors pop up 
I think you're, you hit the nail on the head where you're going to see applications that can bridge the gap and have those blockchains speak to one another, right? That's mm -hmm. kind of that layer two solution where we're going yep. to uh, be able to transact on one and have it uh, parlay over to the other or, or, or vice versa. Um, and you also saw that with the, the Bitcoin blockchain, right? With, with uh, Stacks. They kind of brought the smart contract aspect mm -hmm. to the Bitcoin blockchain, which was really the one hindrance that the Bitcoin blockchain never had that Ethereum did have, right? Is you could build all these smart contracts on. Um, granted, there's more and more applications now. I think smart contract was the, the buzzword back three years ago mm -hmm. that really stood yeah. out with Ethereum. Um, but that really helped bring bring that aspect to the Bitcoin blockchain with with, with stacks and their applications, uh, which which is uh, really really helped. Again, I I think having these different applications speak to one another is going to be paramount to really having the ecosystem grow because if you have let's call it 10 people working on one blockchain 10 on the other you're really segmenting the whole community and if you could bring everyone together mm -hmm. you're just creating more and more opportunities for growth so i think that's yep. going to be something exciting to look forward to yes uh -huh. Yes, yes, yes. Um, and then, all right, so I have you here on the podcast, going to hold you to it. And my my last uh, surprise question for you, the end of year price target for Bitcoin. Come on. End of year 2021 or 2022? Yes. 2021. 2021. Nice. So I'm being generous. We're almost at the end. So if, if, if you asked me this three months ago when we were trending 60 65k i would have said 80 85 um mm -hmm. but what what are we today this is december 13th we're filming and the price is 47 right now i got 40 yep yeah. i'm i'm gonna go i'm gonna go between 53 and 55 okay very conservative heard it here first very heard it heard it here <laughs> first all right 53 to 55k you you heard it here uh, first I'll tell everyone, if, if, if it's not obvious, I'm a big proponent of this space. Um, I'm in it for the long haul. So the, yes, the lower the price can be, the more I can buy over time. So I'm a definitely a happy camper so that it, it can moon <laughs> and explode in a couple of years um, and I can retire early. <laughs> there we go. There we go. Like it. All right, Mark, as always, it, it was an absolute blast having you here on the podcast. Absolute pleasure, my friend. Thank you for having me on, Sean. It's been a pleasure. And then just a just a few quick little uh, notes here at the end, the wrap up. If you are not subbed to the NJCPA Tech Talk podcast, go ahead. It's on every podcast app. It's on YouTube, youtube.com forward slash NJCPA. It's also on the NJCPA site, and, uh, njcpa.org forward slash uh, Tech Talk. <clears throat> and all of the njcpa uh folks out there join the etig at njcpa.org forward slash groups but wait one more thing uh actually the beginning in uh january 2022 the njcpa tech talk podcast is is uh merging with the njcpa issues watch podcast i'll still be here i'll still be hosting it but but now the NJCPA sort of podcast family is merging into one, right? To to cover audit issues, tax issues, ethics, and everything uh, you know IT related to. And so all of that is is also going to be posted on NJCPA.org and on the NJCPA YouTube channel. So uh, so Mark, it was awesome having you here. Best wishes for a happy, healthy end of year and an awesome. Uh, Upcoming one too. You too, Sean. Pleasure catching up, my friend.